Welcome to the Science Salon Podcast. I'm your host, Michael Shermer. My guest this week with her new book is Catherine Wilson. Her book is How to Be an Epicurean, The Ancient Art of Living Well. Catherine is a visiting presidential professor of philosophy at the Cooney Graduate Center and has taught in universities in the United States, Canada, and Europe. She has published more than 100 research papers and eight books on philosophy and its history. She has two children and lives in New York City, uh, which is where she was when I was talking to her. It's apparently quite warm and humid there, so I appreciate her patience. Uh, Apparently, she didn't have air air conditioning there, and I, I can sympathize with that. The book is really interesting. It's um, it's a great read. It's for the general public. Uh, she is a professional scholar who works and publishes in you know technical papers and journals. So, uh, but this is not that. This is for everybody, and it really is a complete worldview from start to finish, from birth to death, from um, you know physics and biology and cognitive uh, psychology to morals, ethics. Um, and how to lead a meaningful life. So she covers all that. We go through most of those um, areas that she covers in the book. And um, we do have a few disagreements. Um, she, interestingly, I didn't get this from the book, but she she's pretty um, strongly opinionated about assessing past behavior on current moral values. That is, the feeling is um, the people back then – who owned slaves, for example, should have known better. They did know better. They did it anyway because the impulse in human nature to dominate others is so strong. Okay, I disagree with that. But she makes a, a pretty good case for that, so you can listen to that. I even pushed her on um, the the whole issue of Joe Biden getting hammered by his own party members uh, for uh, reaching across the aisle and, and dealing with uh, um, you know white supremacists and bigots in the 70s, I, I think – I don't know what was in his heart at the time. I, I doubt that he was a bigot at the time himself or even tolerant of bigots, but that had to get work done uh, in Congress, which is all about compromise. But in any case, you can listen to our disagreements about that and a few other uh, slightly smaller issues, but all interesting nonetheless. Um, and so with that, I give you Catherine Wilson, How to Be an Epicurean. There we go. Thanks for coming on the show. Great to be here. So the new book is How to Be an Epicurean, The Ancient Art of Living Well. Um, I just finished reading it uh, today. It's um, it's a really good read. Let me enter uh, uh, the subject this way, uh, sort of by way of background. I'm a pretty longtime atheist, and in the late 80s, early 90s, the, the atheist slash humanist movement began sort of moving toward creating some kind of worldview that people could live by. This was uh, mainly driven by Paul Kurtz at SUNY Bu- uh, Cooney Buffalo, who felt that he was head of both the the PSYCOP, the now Center for Inquiry, and the, um, the Free Inquiry magazine of the, of the humanist organization he ran. And his feeling was that if we're going to replace God in religion, I mean, if we're going to, if we're going to dispel people of their beliefs in God, we have to replace religion with something. And he kind of had his I have a dream speech to me that, uh, you know, we need to build a equivalent of a church in every city. We need to have uh, marriage ceremonies and babysitting and funerals and, you know, the whole thing um, in, in the sense that the, the idea is that humans need something uh, to replace religion. Now, that was a bit of a pipe dream back then because the numbers of atheists were still pretty low. But I would uh, note, uh, of, I think your book is super important now because – the nuns. Now, this is the people who tick the box for no religious affiliation. We're talking 25% of all Americans, 33% of millennials. It's probably over 40% of iGen or, or um, Gen Z kids born after 1995. Um, now we have a serious issue. What, what, you know, they're not necessarily atheists, but they're not religious. So what are they? And I'm always fond of pointing out, you know, because people say, well, you know, you atheists don't believe this or that, or you atheists believe this or that. It's like atheism is not anything. It's not a worldview. It's nothing. It's just we just don't believe in God, full stop. Well, then what are you? Okay, now, and here's where it gets interesting. Like, well, I'm a humanist, a secular humanist. I'm an enlightenment humanist. I don't know. You know, it's it's like the labels are bounced around. And then I noticed uh, within the last few years, there's been some books on stoicism, and now your book, Epicureanism. And I think it's going to do well, and I think it should do well because I think people need something. 
uh, a worldview, and atheism isn't a worldview. People are abandoning religion. They're not necessarily abandoning some kind of religious spirituality or like in the dating sites, the little box you tick, you know, spiritual but not religious. <laughs> so uh, let's let's start there. How did how did give us a little bit of background uh, about yourself and your and how you got into this particular subject as a branch of philosophy, which is your field. Yeah, well, I'll start by saying I think that uh, that analysis is exactly right. Um, people are afraid of the words atheism and materialism. Um, you usually hear uh, materialism joined to crude materialism, or mm -hmm. I don't know what the adjective is for atheism, but it sounds very forbidding and um, very dark. And it actually always has. Um, and uh, the idea that people need religion, uh, I think that that kind of has two sources. So one is that there could just be a module in the brain that is very attuned to right? Imaginary entities that watch over us, guard us, help us, answer prayers, punish us, um, see our crimes when nobody else does. And uh, you know, some, some evolutionary theorists think, no, we need that for human society to function. It somehow uh, got imprinted on us. And I suppose the other um, the other reason people need it is they do think that there's something about day-to-day -day existence, just getting up and making your breakfast and going to work and coming home and chatting to people somehow leaves them feeling that they lack a wider perspective. Mm -hmm. There's this interest in meaningfulness and, and purpose. And I think Epicureanism does address both of those, um, both of those both those issues. It's completely skeptical about, well, it's not, I, won't, I won't say historical Epicureanism is completely skeptical about the existence of the gods because Epicurus talks about them as living in a different cosmos where they pay no attention to human beings and have absolutely nothing to do with human life. Um, whereas Lucretius, uh, the later Epicurean, Roman, um, first century BCE, seems to just think religion is a source of oppression and there's nothing good to be said about it at all. Uh, but for the, uh, for the ancient Epicureans, um, you know, the only things that existed were things made of atoms, which they thought of as little solid material particles, and things that were composites of atoms and the void in between them. So anything incorporeal, immaterial, you know, just didn't exist. Mm -hmm. And that went for ghosts, angels. And they were the original skeptics. <laughs> they were, yeah. <laughs> so did you personally migrate toward this because you were looking for a worldview, or is this just a pure intellectual exercise? Or both? Yeah, I'm afraid. I'm afraid it's it's the latter. You know how you kind of get into these things um, in accidental ways. Well, that's the story of my whole life in in philosophy. But um, I think somebody uh, asked me to give a talk in maybe early part of this century on Epicureanism and early modern philosophy, because really my specialty is not ancient philosophy at all, but mm. 17th, 18th century. Mm. So I started looking into it. I'd read Lucretius uh, before, but mm -hmm. had pretty much forgotten what was there. And I just got completely enchanted by Lucretius, especially. Mm -hmm. And that made me start looking looking into this and, and seeing how deeply Epicureanism had really impressed itself on, on modern philosophy, 17th and 18th century, even 19th. And um, then I sort of... Um, through a series of stages, uh, got into the less uh, into writing less specialized in less specialized way about Epicureanism. So I did the very short introduction for Oxford, and then and then the, the book you have. And on the way, of course, uh, um, once I had to start thinking about how contemporary life could be seen in Epicurean terms, then uh, scholarship was <laughs> kind of set aside and. And I had to think about things in, in a new way. Yeah, the book is really, it's for everybody. Anybody could pick this up and read it. Uh, and, and it's really a complete worldview from your first three chapters on essentially physics, what we would call physics, biology, and psychology or cognitive science, whatever they would have called them back then, 
and then on to you know social sciences, politics, and then all the great moral issues, abortion and euthanasia, and you know all the way up to life, death, the meaning of life. I mean, it's it's pretty much everything that matters in life can be seen through this lens, and it's amazing how. I mean, most of my thought about the history of science, which is my specialty, you, you know, we usually begin with Copernicus and Galileo and Newton and so on. That whole mechanical universe worldview, that's not new at all. I mean, that is Lucretius, just, you know, a bunch of little atoms, whatever they thought they were and whatever they really are. Conceptually, it's a fine model to start with. It's just atoms bouncing around. And from there, in, in that kind of reductionistic, and, and then you build up from there, you know, s- you synthesize from that to bigger ideas and, and concepts. Yeah, that's uh, that's absolutely right. Um, right. So it didn't all begin with, with Copernicus and Galileo and Descartes. They were drawing on, on these ancient sources that um, – uh, over getting translated in the 15th century and and uh, coming back into into consciousness and of course they had their troubles with religious authority. Sorry, it's 88 degrees in. Ooh, in the, ooh. In, that's right. It's <laughs> humid in New York. Well, I, I don't want to tell you. I'm in Santa Barbara where it's like 65. <laughs> Sorry. Yeah, I understand. I'm totally sympathetic. I love this uh, introduction to the Epicurean Adam. The ancient Epicureans argued that everything in our experience is perishable and will someday perish. But once something exists, they reason, it cannot just become nothing. Correspondingly, the entire universe cannot come out of nothing. It follows that the universe must have emerged from something and that something will always exist no matter how broken up the objects of experience came come to be. You know, I mean, this is still an, a, an issue we wrestle with today. I mean, what, is, what does nothing even mean? I mean, you can't really <laughs> even conceive of it. You know, what was there before the Big Bang? Well, there was nothing before. There was no time before the Big Bang. That, that's when time began. I mean, you, so really, these guys are dealing with the deepest of all issues that there are. Why is there something rather than nothing? And answering it in a fairly cogent way that still makes sense today. Yeah, that's that's right. Yeah, um, right. I mean, something can't come from nothing. And when you talk to physicists, they talk about uh, fluctuations in the quantum vacuum and right. things like that. It still sounds like something. <laughs> yes, exactly. I mean, what you know, what the theist means by nothing. Well, if if you really mean nothing, then there can't even be a god or anything outside of the nothing. I, I mean, even the word no thing. You know, there's not a thing. It, it, it's a thing that doesn't exist implies that there's a thing that doesn't exist. That's not even really nothing. I mean, and there's anyway. It's, I don't want to go off on that because it just gets insane. But, but, it, the, but the point is that these guys deduce this essentially through what just in, inductive reasoning or just you know looking around the world and then thinking about the way things must be. I mean, they didn't have atom smashers, so <laughs> you know they're essentially uh, kind of in, uh, deducting that. Uh, yeah, and uh, what's really fascinating about it is, is even though this isn't completely clear, if I put on my scholarly hat and, and talk about the theory of color, it isn't completely clear whether they think or what they think colors are. But still, the idea that all the qualities of things, the colors, the tastes, the sounds, um, all just emerge from atoms. Mm-hmm including soul atoms. They do have soul atoms, which are, um, well, they're still atoms. They're still material. They're still separated by void. They're just, uh, they're just finer. But somehow the way it's all put together uh, produces this world of appearances. Yeah. How did the Epicureans derive consciousness, mind, from particles bouncing around? Because that's still a problem today. <laughs> yes, yes, the problem of, of qualia, which perhaps no one will, will ever solve. Um, but they have, um, of course, they don't solve this problem because uh, nobody does. So really, all they can say is that the soul atoms are especially mobile and fine and light and pervade, pervade the whole body. And they think that, that there are indirect proofs that consciousness must be material. For example, um, you drink some alcohol and changes your perceptions and moods and, and experiences. And what could be happening except the tiny particles in the, in the alcohol are affecting the tiny particles in your, in your brain. Do they think the atoms themselves then are, are in a way conscious? That's where consciousness, it's, it's built into the substance itself? 
No, unlike unlike some modern panpsychists who think that even mm. the electron is conscious, mm -hmm. they ridicule, uh, mm. Lucretius ridicules that view and says uh, the atoms don't, uh, they don't have a sense of humor, they don't laugh, they don't think, they don't cry. It's just the way in which they're um, put together, yeah. the body, because um, it's the idea is that out of composites come new, emergent, unexpected properties. So consciousness is just one of those things. Yeah. Well, and then from there, they build a theory of human nature and motivation, starting with pleasure and pain. The Epicurean believes that nature is the ultimate source of the oughts, mays, and may nots that play an important role in human life. So from there, you get something like a moral system from which you're punished or not. Uh, banish these superstitions, says the Epicurean. You don't deserve punishment, and you don't deserve to treat yourself either. It isn't a question of deserving at all. Unpack that a little bit for us. <laughs> yeah. Um, I think we tend to think in, in terms of dessert, and advertisers encourage us to think in terms of desserts. You deserve a break today. Mm. You're a special person, so you deserve first-class treatment in the VIP lounge, that, that kind of thing. But dessert is not a concept that plays any role in Epicurean thinking, as far as I can tell. The basis of, of ethics, well, there are really two bases of, of ethics. Um, what do you, prudence is one, looking out for yourself, um, reflecting on what really brings you pleasure and what you only thought was going to bring you pleasure, um, what things are worth enduring or suffering um, in order to get you know, a better experience later. And what's also very important is the principle of not doing harm to others. That's uh, really the, the the basic the basic insight, um, and of course that's very traditional. You find it in other religions, and it doesn't. It's not proved. I think it's just taken as a postulate that because pleasure is good and pain is bad, avoid hurting other people as far as possible. And even though that sounds simple, it's actually terribly complicated because just about everything we do has externalities and side effects and consequences that do hurt people or put them at risk or or make them vulnerable. So we can't go through life completely avoiding harm, but ethically you try to minimize it. And this um, leads to, I think, a very critical perspective on political institutions and um, the way we organize labor, the way we organize our domestic lives, um, and always keeping that principle in mind is um, just incredibly useful. Yeah, I think you've you've captured the essence of ethics there. It's you know what's good for me, and then what's good for you. They're not always aligned, and even what's good for me may not be good for me in the long run. So you know we should probably dispel the myth of the Epicurean as as just pleasure seeking. Uh, I, I may I may feel really good after a huge meal, but the next morning or two hours later, I don't feel so good. Uh, you know, so we have to make a distinction between short term and long term pleasures. But also, it's not just pleasures. There's things I might do that I don't enjoy doing, but help you and makes me feel better as a better person, a more virtuous person in the long run. That's a hard balance to find, and it seems very specific oriented. It depends on exactly what we're talking about. Uh, yes, absolutely, and and I take um, I take a fairly risk risk friendly view in the book, um, as you know. Um, too much prudence can uh, spoil one's pleasures. You have to take some risks. I think uh, George Ainley, uh, philosopher, economist, psychologist, makes this point uh, very nicely. Um, you have to gamble um, sufficiently often that it's really meaningful when you win. And uh, mm -hmm. you're not too broken up when you lose. Yeah, you don't um, want to save up for for the the, gr the greatest ninetieth birthday party of all time, and then you keel over dead at eighty nine. Uh, <laughs> actually, I've been thinking about this recently because I'm about to turn sixty five, so I'm getting notices from the government saying, you know, you can start collecting next year when you're sixty six, mm -hmm. and you get this amount. But if you wait till you're seventy, you get this amount. And you wait to seventy two, you get this amount. And I realized I'm betting against the government about when I'm going to die. 
And it's a little bit what you're talking about. It's like, well, I want to be kind of prudent here and not not just grab the money instantly because I can get more <laughs> if I delay gratification. But on the other hand, they're going to win if I wait too long. Exactly. But uh, you know what? It just really doesn't matter because that's all been worked out actuarially. Mm. So, yes, your your life expectancy, uh, whether you're going to live another 20 years or another 18 years, is taken into account uh, when you start taking it. So um, I think you can flip a coin. <laughs> but so, so tell us a little bit of how, how an Epicurean would calculate how much pleasure I should seek short term, you know, in an, on any given day versus I should plan for next week or next month or plan for my retirement? Where do you find that balance? Um, well, I think pleasure seeking um, doesn't usually work out so well. Um, reflection, just going about your ordinary life and doing what you do, but then thinking about the things that you purchased that really gave you pleasure. Um, maybe you liked your furniture or your paintings or your clothes, or you went to a museum and you had a really great time, or you took a walk and it was wonderful, even though you didn't want to and you were reluctant. So reflecting on the things that were worth it and the things that really weren't worth it is, I think, the useful exercise. But if you if you get out of bed and think, how can I have the happiest day possible? Um, you know, that's, uh, that's, I think, not going to be a very productive way to plan the day. Think about it. Right, because as a thought experiment, just think of just taking some dopamine charged drug every day, or or some hallucinogen, <laughs> or whatever it is that gets you off, and just do that all day. That's not that's not a meaningful life. So there, I think maybe the Epicurean would make a distinction between happiness and meaningfulness. Yeah, so though it's not something they they talk about, um, but I think Epicurus, though he really is quite intellectual. He he loves the study of nature. He wrote all these books on everything from astronomy to kingship to marriage to everything. He was just interested, as as you were saying, in in every aspect of nature, science, and, and and being able to be really um, absorbed in those things, curious about them, um, seeking knowledge. Um, the Stoics make the same point. Um, this is what you know really makes life worth living. You get up in the morning and you want to, at least I do, want to see what happened in the news, mm -hmm. what's going on in the world. Then, um, maybe, thanks. maybe we should make a parenthetical note here, make a distinction between Stoicism and, and, and uh, Epicureanism for us. Okay. Um, uh, they're rivals, so they tended to uh, perhaps exaggerate their differences just in order to make the point that they were different from the others. Stoics have a different cosmology. It's not atomistic. Um, it is providential. They have something like a divinity um, that pervades the whole universe and gives it order and had a creative function. And their view of human life is that you should always be prepared for the worst. And you should apply the forces of your mind to distance yourself from emotions. All extreme emotions, at least the extreme Stoics said this, are bad. Yeah. You know, even like, too much love, too much joy, too much excitement, all bad, along with any form of anger, even righteous anger. Um, and any form of suffering. So you steal yourself, the mind is more powerful than the emotions, they thought. And um, you know, even if your child dies, you just ask yourself, well, did I think children never die in this world? No. And that's quite a useful perspective in, in some cases. Um, distancing yourself from what's going on can be very effective, especially if you're suffering a lot about something. But Epicureans, a did not think you could that the mind could really squelch the emotions mm. in every case. They thought distancing was just impossible in some cases. And why should you? Because emotional experience is very gratifying to people. That you know, if you 
If you take drugs that blunt your emotions, most people find that really unbearable. They go uh, right off those medicines, I understand. Mm -hmm. Um, so we need an, an emotionally colored world, an emotionally colored form of experience. And um, again, this, this uh, idea about risk, you can't insulate yourself from all risks or from all psychological or physical pain. It's just going to come along. But um, on balance, right, you can uh, <laughs> right, have a nice life. But, you, but you've, you personally follow Epicureanism more than Stoicism. Absolutely. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Yeah. I f I, my feeling is the sto Stoic worldview is a little darker, uh, maybe than the Epicurean worldview. Um, the world's a dangerous, harsh place. We got to deal with it. So on. It is. It is a dangerous, harsh place, but it's more than that. <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah. Well, I think Stoicism found a lot of resonance in people who were um, very politically engaged, who depended on the favor of others on winning law cases, on staying on the right side of, of those in power. And that's a very vulnerable position to be in. Mm. You displease the emperor and uh, you know, that's the end of your life or you're sent into exile. So they did have to prepare themselves against these shocks and reversals that come along in, in a very engaged and political life, whereas the Epicurean solution was, was stay out of all that if mm. you want to right, make yourself miserable. And they were criticized for that, for being apolitical. Oh. So when I when I develop an uh, Epicurean politics, so really I'm going uh, a bit outside of historical Epicureanism, uh, but not outside the way Epicureanism was interpreted later by political theorists. Although a lot of politics really is just, it's just ethics of how others are treated based on what we do and what policy we're going to write out for what we should allow or not allow, really. I mean, just think of immigration or, uh, or, or abortion or something like this. You know, to what extent do I want to impose my beliefs on others because I think it's good for everybody? And, you know, we're all kind of voting like that. In that sense, I don't know if that's Epicurean or Stoicism or what it is, but <laughs> right. And um, we need, I, I uh, argued in the book, let's talk about rights. Mm. Rights to confuse the issue. Uh, Jeremy Bentham, the great utilitarian, made this point. And let's look instead at, at people's experiences. What do guns do to people's experiences? What does abortion or the um, prohibition on abortion do to people's experiences? Where are the pains? Where are the pleasures? Yeah. Um, instead of talking about uh, the right of the mother over her body or the right to bear arms, that's just not helpful. Yeah, you rejected both positions on the abortion issue, I noticed. That, well, the Epicurean uh, – I'm just saying you and the Epicureans are the same, I guess, at least for the for, for the talking about this book. Uh, but n n that it's neither – um, the right of the mother to do whatever she wants with her body and the, and the fetus is part of her body so she can do what she wants with it, or the pro-life position and the opposite of that. What's the Epicurean position on that? Uh, yeah, well, I really had to think this up because um, the Epicureans themselves, as far as I know, maybe in one of those texts buried in the volcano, there's something about this. But the the argument I came up with for why Abortion is permissible, but not infanticide, uh, because I think that's really the heart of the matter. Mm -hmm. uh, if you can save yourself a lot of trouble and expense and friction uh, by not having a two-year-old, um, right, in the same way you can save yourself a lot of trouble and expense and, and um, uh, uh, frustration of your life plans by not having a baby in the first place, well, why aren't you permitted to kill the two-year-old? And my argument was that once a child is born, or even when it's quite close to being born, um, it's something that could be part of human society. And I think that is an Epicurean principle. You're in human society or you're not in human society. That could sound speciesist, and maybe it is, but um, I accept that anyway. Whereas you can't, a fetus is not part of human society. It's until it's born. For, yeah, until it's born. So it's, so. Per, it's kind of a personhood argument. You don't become a legal person until you're born. Except, yeah, except so. in the third trimester where if the woman is murdered, then it's a double homicide. 
That's right. Yeah. Yeah. Then then there's an argument for saving the baby because it, it can be brought up. It can be nourished. Yeah. But um, you know, would uh, abortion opponents think we ought to raise fetuses in test tubes until they're uh, you know, able to join the rest of us? I don't think so. Right. And, um, seems to me that's the alternative. <laughs> yeah. So politically, you're pro-choice. Yes. Yeah. I am too, but barely, I say, because, um, you know, I, I have to recognize that while it's not a person, a fetus, say, within the first two trimesters, is certainly a potential person, and it is a human. And, uh, you know, so the, pro, the pro-life arguments are, are reasonably good. Um, I, I just think it's a special case. It's not like murder of, of some different kinds of homicides or whatever. It's different from pretty much everything else. Uh, Dinesh D'Souza was making this point. I've debated him many times on lots of different issues. He's a you know conservative Christian, and I'm not. Um, but he makes the point that you know when women when women get pregnant and they want to have their baby, they don't describe it as as tissue or you know a medical procedure I'm going to have or it's this biological stuff or you know uh, you know the kinds of terms you use when you're going to get an abortion. Uh, so I think our our intuitions about this very much depend on whether we want it or not. Um, there's a there's a book called Hardness. I think it was Hardness of Hardness of Life, not Hardness of Heart, or something like that. It was about uh, infanticide, you know, before the 20th century, mm-hmm. and, and essentially uh, before you know abortion procedures were safe and and effective, you know, infanticide was was the essentially what we would call abortion. Just you get rid of it after birth instead of before birth. Not because they hated babies or whatever. It's just the hardness of life. You know, most most people were impoverished and could not afford an extra mouth to feed and so on. And, you know, it's just one of those hard choices that are made. Yeah, um, yeah, that's that's absolutely right. If you see abortion as uh, as the, the much softened form of a traditional human practice that has gone on since... Thousands of years, Still yeah. on in hunter-gatherer societies, went on in ancient times. They exposed their unwanted children. The father got to decide whether yeah. the baby lived or, or was exposed. And, um, and of course, down through the ages, people have well, left the baby out in the, in the trash, essentially. So if you can, if, with that being the background, abortion appears like, to the really, really moderate alternative. That said... No, killing things, killing living things is kind of per se bad. Um, and um, obviously anything we can do to make the situation not need to arise uh, is good. Uh, financial support, moral support, right? Uh, help for people. Um, but. Right. Well, the way I've configured it is it's the problem is not um, abortion. The problem is unwanted pregnancies. Yes. Okay, why are they unwanted and why are they getting pregnant? Uh, yeah. So, I mean, these are two different issues, but the main one really, you know, poverty, uh, lack of education, lack of access to cheap or, or free birth control. Um, you know, the, the, these are actually relatively easy problems to solve in, to, in the modern world. Uh, it's mostly political objections to it or maybe economic objections to it or controls of it. Mm-hmm. Fine. What about uh, Epicurean position on euthanasia and, and physician-assisted suicide or whatever? How do they reason their way around that? Yeah. Well, Epicurus um, tries to discourage suicide, um, perhaps because the Stoics uh, were, were not, not exactly in favor, but they really thought suicide is always an option if things are not going well for you. So... Mm. You know, the king sends you into exile or you are disgraced in front of everybody. Well, there's a way out. The door is open, as they like to say. And Epicurus thought this was a pretty bad attitude. He thought you could even live with really disabling conditions like blindness, um, which um, you know, many modern psychologists think so as well. You, you yeah. adapt to these limitations and pains and you still get enjoyment in life. But oh, if, the, if the painfulness of life and the hopelessness of your situation really do outweigh oh, any joy you can take in food, drink, and company, um, yes, then um, you should have the option of, of the way out. There's nothing sacred 
about life because there's nothing sacred in Epicurean cosmology. Right, right. <laughs> so, yeah, we yeah. should we should uh, you know, you know pu- 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 punch that that you know there's no superstition, there's no supernatural, there's no afterlife. This is it. And, and so the argument there, I would add, um, from recent research, is that people who try to kill themselves and fail are almost always grateful that they failed and really didn't understand why them why they themselves decided to try that. You know, they just had a peculiar turn of mind at that moment, which is why the suicide hotline is is a good idea. Call somebody before you do it, just in case, because most of them change their mind after some time. And then the other bit of research on ha- happiness is that we have that set point where even after a major blow, a divorce or a you know catastrophic health problem, death in the family, most people bounce back after some period of time to that set level that their temperament genetics gave them. And so you may be feeling suicidal now, but give it a week or two or a month or so, and you may not feel that way. Yeah, exactly. And that's why it's always a tragedy when a young person, as opposed to a very old person who's you know, really, really in terrible shape and not enjoying life, um, kills themselves because the causes are so um, incommensurable. Right? Your boyfriend broke up with you or you failed the test or right. didn't get to med school or even though you're going, you're going bankrupt. Those are not reasons to, to kill yourself. Um, but um, that's uh, what our emotionality is like. People will do desperate things in the short term. Yeah. So we're recording this uh, one week after Jeffrey Epstein uh, killed himself. And contrary to, uh, I made this observation that most Christians believe uh, in the afterlife in part because it's a cosmic courthouse where God is going to judge everybody and therefore Hitler didn't get away with it. And Stalin didn't get away with it. They're all going to be judged. And that feels good. Like, yeah, yeah, that's the way the universe should be. But no one's rejoicing that Epstein killed himself. It's like, good riddance. He's gone. We don't want him around anymore. And God's going to judge him now. No, everyone's <laughs> pissed. They're pissed because he didn't get his justice now. It makes me wonder, maybe there's a, an element of doubt in the Christian mind or the believer's mind, you know, m- maybe there isn't a cosmic justice. Maybe we really should fight for justice in the here and now. Yeah. Well, I have quite complicated feelings about that case. Um, and hmm, how, can I, how can I express this? Um, if I were Jeffrey Epstein, I would certainly want to kill myself as well. Um, it was, you know, it would just be the end of the road for me. Um, you know, all my resources of getting out of things had been exhausted. I was going to face life in a horrible prison situation for you know, the next 25, 35 years. So his suicide is completely understandable. And I feel some compassion for him because why do you want someone to suffer that out of desert Mm -hmm. again as an epicurean i just don't believe in this term desert Mm -hmm. um it's not going to deter him from doing these things again um well of course it is going to deter jail would but not he's not he's not going to have a change of mind yeah exactly yeah right i mean he he himself said he, he he's comfortable in his own skin knowing he likes young girls that are teenagers yeah, and that's not going to change. No, so he did these things to people, and they were things he shouldn't have done. Are they horrific crimes? Are they like war crimes and torturing people? No, they were still bad. But um, to talk of to speak of them as horrific crimes, I don't see it that way. Yeah, I'm going to make myself unpopular by 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 saying that. So I think. Um, this um, this retributive pursuit of him that he should have been made to suffer for his crimes. I'm just not on board with that. Mm-hmm. I think he he took the only way out that you know, someone in his situation could have taken. Maybe that's a rather stoic perspective on it, but I think it's also an Epicurean perspective. Mm-hmm. So what's important is the lesson of Jeffrey Epstein. How... Um, 
the social framework um, let this man get away with these things for so long and all his rich and powerful friends and lawyers, mm -hmm. how they facilitated this and tolerated this. That's what we need to be thinking about, not this individual man who's now dead. Right. Well, first, I, I, I think it is okay to, we have to be able to distinguish between degrees of evilness or degrees of crime. Uh, I mean, analogously, um, let's say after the Second World War, when the Allies denazified Germany and they took down statues of Hitler and swastikas and they renamed streets, you know, the, you know, Hermann Goering Strasse and, and Joseph Goebbels Strasse, you just don't do that. But, you know, I would not put Robert E. Lee in the same category. You know, a statue of Robert E. Lee or Robert E. Lee High School. Yeah, I mean, there's, there's all these schools and streets and statues in the South. I, I just, I mean, I've read a, about his attitudes about African Americans and so on and slaves. Yes, yeah, this is not good, but we're judging him by, you know, 2019 standards. He's not Hitler. He's not Joseph Goebbels. Uh, you know, we have to be able to make that distinction, I think. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yes, there's a clearly a continuum. Look, I've been fascinated by um, this uh, recent set of stories in the New York Times about the history of slavery. Mm -hmm, yeah. So I made a little point about history writing in the book uh, before all this came out and about how selective uh, the American history we're all taught in high school mm -hmm. is. Um, it just bears very little relation to what... Uh, actually was going on with the lives of ordinary people. You mean most people were not slaveholders and so on? Uh, yeah, well, in the South, you yeah. were either, right? Um, I imagine there were some uh, small farmers who were not part of this plantation system, but it's basically a system of landowners and, and slaves. Yeah. So this series has been uh, gone into great detail about um how you're, 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 you're talking about the 1619 project. Yes, yeah. yeah this, uh, I, I just saw there was some, somebody wrote a, a critical piece of it on it. I haven't read it yet. I haven't even read the whole thing. I read bits and part pieces. Um, I'm a, I'm a, of a mixed mind about it. Um, I think it's good to have that other perspective to a certain extent, to put things into perspective, to take the you know, interchangeable perspectives principle of, of morality I mean, when I when in the seventies when I read "Bury My Heart at Wounded Knee," it's like, oh crap! I had no idea these things were going on. This is really bad, and you know, how come we didn't? How come I didn't learn about that in grammar school and junior high school and and, and so forth. Um, but on the other hand, we don't want to turn America into nothing but this oppressive regime, you know, on par with the Nazis. You know, you know, there, again, there's degrees of oppression. Or, or you know, uh, or immoral behavior as judged by modern standards. Um, I don't know. I'm 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 a little conflicted about all that. Mm, yeah. Well, I see it as uh, part and parcel of the same thing. This uh, human desire for domination and power and uh, indifference to the the sufferings of others. So, um, uh, I but but I didn't catch what 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 your position is on this uh, on like that project 1619 or. The sort of rev revising of American history based on modern moral standards. Um, I think standards are timeless. Um, I've been working on some of uh, the 18th century philosophers who are um, no very dismayed at warfare, slavery, mm -hmm. oppression of women. And I think the idea that you know, um, everybody accepted these things um, is wrong. I think mm -hmm. many people didn't know about them, so they um, took no position one way or the other. Um, but I think without sort of um, terrifying young children, um, we have to present to them um, a less a less boring for one thing, uh, but more, <laughs> more socially accurate view of, of what the past was like and, and how destructive um, the impulse to dominate and enslave um, really, really is. I don't know how many Native Americans were exterminated uh, relative to number of, of people killed by the by the Nazis, but it's very substantial. Oh, much worse than the Nazis. I mean, it was 70 to 90 million, 90% of which were exterminated. 
not not just that, but but of course their culture. The you know there was at least six hundred different languages gone, mostly mostly gone. Yeah. So I mean, in terms of like reparations for African Americans, if you open that door, what about Native Americans? They they could make a case just as just as strong, I would think. Mm -hmm. Yeah. All right, and even in uh, Canada, where I lived for many years, and which is um, much more socially conscious about reparations, mm -hmm. reparations have not been terribly effective. They're, they've not been carried out in an imaginative and meaningful way. They've just given money to people, but um, not given them anything like their old way of life back because they can't, and not given them any, any substitute for it. So it's a very difficult question. Yeah, truth and reconciliation panels and movements, I think, are good. But when it comes right down to, you know, where the rubber meets the road, you know, are you going to give people money? Are you going to open new schools? Or, you know, what actually are you going to do besides apologizing, which is a good start, I guess. In Germany, my wife's from Cologne, uh, so we go there once a year. There are, in cities all over Germany, these little, what are called stumbling stones. They're these brass uh, you know, sort of two inch by two inch uh, stones that are, you know, put uh, brass plates put on stones with engraved the Jews that were used to live at that house right there. And they were deported on this date and they were murdered on this date and so on. It's kind of a reminder. I think it's terrific. But Germany also pays reparations um, still today. And so th this is one of the analogies used for reparations for African Americans. Look, Germany does this, Israel accepts it, you know, living Jews accept it. Then the counter to that is, yeah, but the, the, these are people, the perpetrators are still alive, the victims are still alive, or immediate for next generation uh, related to them. Uh, maybe that's different than African American reparations because none of us were involved in slavery or were slaves. I don't know how you feel about that. Yeah. Well, um, I don't think that reparations have to take the, the form of direct payments to people, but um, the government needs to do something about um, the condition that most immigrants and um, most descendants of slaves live in. Um, I've lived myself in the, in the Bronx, and I visit various parts of New York that um, many people in my social class never see, mm. never to go there. And it's um, it's a disaster. It's yeah. miserable. Yeah, yeah. And and oh, why can't this is a rich country? There is plenty of money in this country. Why can't more be done for people? What do you think about UBI, like like uh, Yang Yang Gangs, Andrew Yang's <laughs> idea of the you know thousand dollars a month for everybody? Yeah, um, uh, I would love to see the experiment. Might work. I it think might. it's an empirical question. Yeah. Yeah. Well, but but back to my pre previous point about re revising the past, judging the past based on current standards, like Bill Maher had a riff on this on, on his show Friday night about, um, you know, liberals going after Bernie Sanders or, or um, Joe Biden for his, you know, not condemning uh, racists and bigots back in the 70s and some of these white supremacists he had to work with and so on. Of course, he was bragging, look, I'm able to reach across the aisle. I can make things happen even with a, you know, a KKK white supremacist. And of course, he's gotten hammered for that. Uh, so Bill's point was, you know, we're going to lose another election if we keep doing this. We can't judge people by our 2019 standards. I mean, Hillary and Obama both were against gay marriage in 2011. That's not that long ago. Um, is it really fair to critique them by today's standards? Um, um, I think that's a very interesting question and actually a very complex one um, because you have to ask yourself, did they have the information? Could they have taken the different stance? Um, because on one hand, I want to say, look, ethics is timeless, and we have had people who have been strongly against the kinds of things that Joe Biden was accepting of, um, and were not afraid to be so. We just took that took that moral stand. Um, on the other hand, there are things that um, where you do sort of feel that. Well, they just didn't know. There hadn't been the right amount of discussion to be able to take a sensible position on that. Um, so what's, what's an example there? Um, 
I mean, some people would say gay marriage, that, that you know, we didn't really understand that, that gay people fell in love and wanted to get married until they explained all that to us mm-hmm. and until mm-hmm. they had parades and marches and agitation. And then we said, oh, yes, okay, yeah, um, we, we should do that. So um, I'm not sure about Biden, but I'm inclined to be not terribly sympathetic. Really? Wow. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Okay. Yeah. Well, because I think he could have been quite well, may- straightforwardly pro-integration. May- maybe back. we should make a distinction well, between what's in somebody's heart or mind and political expediency. You know, I don't like this guy. I don't like his attitudes, but I got to pass this bill and he's going to vote yes if I vote for him on this other thing. And it's just horse trading. Uh, there's a great movie about Lincoln that suggested that that was what was going on. Yeah, well, he really maybe. Had to do a lot. And Jefferson, too. You know, maybe you, you just can't – we can't get all 13 colonies on board if we uh, ban slavery. So we got to put up with it, and hopefully it'll work itself out at some point. But we're moving forward with independence. Yeah. Well, I, I do agree that incrementalism has, has a place. Um, this point has been made that – um, so often a treaty isn't ideal, a treaty between two countries, a so disarmament treaty right. or border right. treaty. It's not great. There are going to be violations. Right. People are going to complain. But it's so much better than nothing. So put something in there, and then you can refine it and make it better. So I think uh, the hope, for example, with, with health care was that you would put something in. Yeah. Obamacare, it wasn't great. It was still right, too much of the old system. Yeah too tied into the insurance companies, but at least it was in there, and then you could build on it and and develop it. Um, but instead, we've seen it being kind of uh, subject to attrition. And so this idea go. that there's, there's kind of u- universal morals or ethics that we know, um, d- is it your sense that people have always known kind of deep in their heart all people should be treated equally? But fuck it, I'm gonna. I have the power, so I'm gonna. I'm gonna lord it over them. You know, all the way back to Romans with slaves, or you know, Greeks or whoever. They kind of know we shouldn't be doing this, but well, whatever. I'm just gonna do it because I can. Yeah. Well, I suppose there's um, some people uh, have a much stronger urge to dominate than others, but a lot depends on what your culture is telling you. And since ancient times, we have validated warriors and conquerors and big men and strong men. Um, and uh, uh, our societies have been organized in ways that, that uh, made those people very important and made those sorts of attitudes important philosophically to represent. And um, that's why having a, a different perspective on yeah. How people work and how society could work is so important. My friend Richard Dawkins makes this point um, in his book, The God Delusion, about – this is in his section on the changing moral zeitgeist – that you can pinpoint a novel down to about the decade it was written in the last, say, 150 years based on how the uh, author characterizes Jews and blacks and women and so on. In, in, in a way that's – when you read it today, it's kind of cringeworthy. But – but 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 by what you're saying, it's like well they should have known better and they shouldn't have written it like that. I I, I disagree with it. I think that's the moral zeitgeist of the time. Everybody thought that they weren't thinking like we think today. They it never occurred to them that that's not how women think or that's not what Jews are like or whatever. Yeah yeah um, no I can I can see that that's kind of a plausible position. An example from my own experience is uh, I've been reading um, some short stories of Nabokov lately. Mm -hmm. And um, uh, he is a writer that I've always really loved and found very wonderful, subtle, entertaining, Mm -hmm. beautiful wordsmith. But in these stories, oh my goodness, maybe it's because I'm in my late 60s myself, but... um, there really is a fixation on very young women, mm-hmm. Jeffrey Epstein style, mm-hmm. and a sort of repulsion from any woman over 45. Mm-hmm. He describes mm-hmm. such women in very unflattering terms. Mm-hmm. And I found this quite disturbing. 
Mm. And it did seem like um, a kind of peculiarity of, of this writer, even though oh, it may well have been the zeitgeist or uh, everybody thought like that. So, yeah. Do you, do you think go- something like that could get published today? Or if it did by a fringe publisher, it would be successful? No, I think um, the critics would trash it. Probably the editors would trash it uh, before it got that far. Right. Um, even even writers like Philip Roth and John Updike are quite painful for us to read today. I right. think, at least for women to read today, even though we admire many things about you know, their their. And isn't right and isn't skill. that the changing moral zeitgeist? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, much of this, it's like that interview with somebody dug up an interview in Playboy magazine with John Wayne. You know, when he was talking about in Native Americans, he called Indians and, and blacks and so on. It, but it's like, but, you know, he was born in 1920 something. That's kind of what people born in that decade, that's kind of how they think. Mm-hmm. No yeah. surprise. No one yeah. would say that today. <laughs> well, maybe this is an argument of hope that um, – at some future date, we will see things like factory labor and the prison system and uh, the defense system as like, bizarre aberrations of former people. Well, I think so. I mean, that's the the arc of the moral universe bending toward justice and and so yes. forth. Uh, <laughs> I, I think I think there's real moral progress. In, in a way, I, I guess I might agree with you in part that I think there are um, there are moral truths to be discovered that almost everybody would rather be alive than dead, free than slaved, healthy than sick, and, and, and so on, right down the line, uh, not discriminated against, and so on. How do you know? Just ask people. They'll tell you. Uh, I mean, it's it's not rocket science. And in a way, we can discover that by you know social science, in a way, or mor- the moral sciences, and so on. And I think those are eternal truths, like mathematical truths, that you can then extrapolate. The universe is a certain way. You know, mammals, social mammals want to be treated a certain way in their group. And you can figure that out. Again, it's not rocket science. And I think that's kind of been – that's what we've been driving toward. You know, Peter Singer's expanding moral circle. We we keep including more and more people in the circle. Of course, he wants to go one more step with animal, all sentient beings, not just humans. I think you said Epicureans were not that enlightened. <laughs> 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 they were meat eaters. <laughs> Um, yeah, anyway, so I, 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 I think that part is true. I just, I'm not, not, not particularly judgmental of, of people in the past. Um, I don't know. I mean, the Jefferson case, uh, you know, he's, you know, one of my heroes and one of the more enlightened deists at the time, still the slavery thing is kind of bothersome. And some of these founding fathers could have freed their slaves. They didn't. Why didn't they? I don't, you know, you know, it's hard, it's hard, hard to say. Let's hit a few more points. Uh, I want to be mindful of your time and the heat there of of the Epicurean worldview. Um, Epicurean view of death. Other than yes. there's nothing after this, but but yeah. but uh, death death is not an evil. Um, for one thing, you're not going to experience it, and um, dying even Epicureans thought is not going to be painful. Uh, because you're going to gradually just fade out, your senses will go, your movement will go. It's really not going to be as, as bad as you think. Um, I criticize that claim in the book um, based on an article in The Lancet I came across that said, no, in fact, end-of-life suffering uh, really is a, a global problem. Mm-hmm. That Something like 40% of the dying do not have access to adequate pain relief yeah, or yeah. Um, end, end of life support. So I think that's a, a little sanguine. But the basic idea of the Epicureans is um, well, life is finite, so make the most of it, enjoy it, um, enjoy it as long as you can. Um, the purpose of life as Buffon, great French naturalist and Epicurean um, oh, said, Buffon was? I didn't know that. Interesting. <laughs> Yeah, I think so. Purpose of life is to have lived. And I think that's a very profound Oh, I like that. I like that. It's simple, but it's true. Um, I guess to the the credit of the ancient Epicureans, um, they probably died sooner than people do today. Medical technology is so good. We can keep people alive for months or years 
when they probably would have died much earlier. So the suffering can go on much longer. But if you don't have good hospice care with, you know, morphine drip or something to, to, to eradicate the pain, yeah, that could be worse. But they didn't have that, so they probably died much sooner. Yeah. Well, I don't know if they, if they died so much sooner. Oh, they had better diets, less air pollution, mm. stress, probably. They didn't no, have but I mean, I mean, the time from, say, when things are starting to go— and you're going to yes. die within a few weeks or months. Now we can keep you going for a year or many months. And oh, that, yeah. and if you don't, and if you don't have adequate medical care to, to to also eliminate the pain, then the suffering could go on. Anyway, I guess that's a debatable point. But um, okay, what can we know? And so this is sort of the epistemology of of, of um, Epicureanism, uh, you know, and science and skepticism. What do we know that's true, and, and so on? What what do Epicureans think about that? Well, there I was trying to trying to address the the problem of, of a science skepticism, and many people just being unmoved. I was thinking of, of global warming and uh, and uh, gun control as as examples where mm. people are just kind of unmoved by the facts. Yeah, this is a problem that gets a lot of discussion these days, and one problem is that that scientists themselves until recently. Um, always presented us with the scientific uh, attitude that, well, we haven't really proved it. We're not ready to make recommendations because we haven't studied this problem long enough. And that's a very respectable laboratory position to take. Yeah. And um, But it doesn't address things that really are a crisis where you have to act in advance of full information. So um, it's quite helpful for people, I think, to un for scientists themselves to be uh, more decisive about what they think and what they think ought to be done, um, and and for people to be more willing to make uncomfortable decisions, even when something hasn't been proved. Um, the other source of mistrust of science is um, journalism that every day tells us something different about. Yeah what we should eat or what operation on our knee we should have or shouldn't have. And people are just baffled because. Yeah. You know, I loved your discussion of diet and nutrition because this drives me crazy because I've had uh, I, on the podcast, I had Nina Teicholtz who wrote that book, big fat, fat surprise and Gary Tobbs, who's been on this for you know 25 years, skeptical of the food pyramid and so on. And, and now it looks like they, they you know, they're on the right track that, you know, meat and it, eggs and butter, it's okay. Yeah. You know, maybe the yeah. Epicurean position would be all things in moderation or something like that. But, <laughs> but you know, not 100% total, um, you, know, you know, exclusion from your diet. Yeah. No, quite right. They were actually a very abstemious, at least Epicurus claimed to be very abstemious. Really? And, yeah, a little, a little bread and cheese and you don't have to have fish every day or wine or... Well, wa well, wine, yeah. wa well, a little wine every day is good. <laughs> <laughs> One of my favorite restaurants back in the '80s, where I used to live, was called the Epicurean. It was a you know sort of fine dining kind of thing. There, they're going for the meme that you know good food and and good immediate pleasures is what it's all about. That's not the Epicurean. All right, let's look at a cu couple more of these big ones. Um, let's see. Oh, so well, we, did did we cover all of epistemology? How we know what's true? And well, your point was that we can make decisions that have to be made now under uncertainty. You know, if, if almost all scientists say global warming is real and human cause, we should probably do something about it without being apocalyptic about it. We should still do something. Um, that seems reasonable. Or this is what the best science tells us about diets. You should exercise and not eat too much fat and sugar and so on. Something like right. that. Yeah. And the connection to Epicureanism is just all these all these phenomena depend on the behavior of tiny imperceptible atoms whose mm. behavior is very hard to figure out from the surface. Yeah. All right. The Meaningful Life, your last chapter, besides your distinction between this and Stoicism, how do we how, how does one lead a meaningful life? How do you lead a meaningful life? What do you do? Well, I don't I don't try for it, for one thing. Okay, um, so all right. Far. Well, that's a point. That's a good point. Yeah, yeah. Um, pursuit of pleasure or meaning, I think, are um, not not good strategies. Um, um, 
Right. So that that chapter was a somewhat negative that I argued against two culturally common ways of thinking about meaningfulness as achievement, as extraordinary achievement, yeah, and, yeah. Um, prizes and money and, and things like that, um, or as um, service to others. So um, what else is there? Um, I think engagement with things that speak to you. So you find music that you like, art that you like, landscapes that you like, um, books that you like, and you engage with them, subjects you're interested in. And this feeling of um, making it mine or having a particular relationship uh, to other human minds and other human talents through these external things, that's what makes life feel meaningful. And I think feeling meaningful is enough. It doesn't have to be meaningful. Right. Meaningful to you. Not yeah. not some objective standard where you have to be an Einstein or a Mother Teresa or or else your life is meaningless. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. yeah interesting. Yeah. yeah. I think that idea of of getting up in the morning, think, well, what am I going to do to lead a meaningful life? Is the wrong question to ask. <laughs> you just have yeah. to just be alive. Just do something. Yeah. But I think it's also the wrong question to ask. Um, when you get up in the morning, what do I have to do to make more money? Yes. <laughs> or to right, polish my reputation? <laughs> so. Yes, well, that's a concern about uh, a lot of the psychologists who study happiness, this hedonic treadmill that people get on. Like, I got to have more stuff because the guy next to me has more stuff. And that there, you know, there's no fixed set point. The set point keeps going up and up as society gets richer, or people have more stuff you're never going to be satisfied if that's the route you've gone down because you're never going to have enough stuff. Yeah. Right. And the marginal utility of um, diminishing margin utility. utility yes. Is, um, but I think that the point has been made recently that uh, people who have $10 billion don't need $11 billion, right. but somehow they feel better if they have that extra billion dollars um, because it, it validates them. It shows they are um, they are good people. They are intelligent people. They are good businessmen. So it's all about how your self image is affected by um, mm. getting more, or having mm. more things, having more temporarily than the person next door. Yeah, although I, I'm always um, leery of the argument that money doesn't make you happier after whatever it was, $75,000 a year, whatever you need for kind of the basics of living in a big American city. Uh, because in a way it could be used by, say, rich conservatives to tell poor liberals, don't you be raising taxes and that kind of stuff <laughs> because all this money and my big mansion and my yacht, it doesn't make me any happier. So you just be happy with your place in life down there. Uh, no, no, no. I don't like that argument because having money – it, it, the money itself may not do it, but it gives opportunities to do so many more things. I mean, I I would love to start my own charity like Bill Gates, but I don't have that kind of money. So it you know just the kind of opportunities you have, particularly when you're on the margins and so much of your brain is filled with how am I going to pay my mortgage? How am I going to even pay the electric bill? And all that's all you think about is what I got to keep working and keep working and keep working. There's not, not much time for reflection of these more meaningful things, whatever it would be for you individually. So I, and, and I don't think we need to put a cap on it. Like, well, at $75,000, don't bother making any more money. Actually double that would be great. And double that again would be even better, not for the money, but for the things I can then do or I, that things I don't have to worry about that then gives me more opportunities to help people or whatever it is that I, I want to engage in. I don't know. What well, are your thoughts you on that? Would, you would do this, Michael, but where are all the rich people fixing the self, the South Bronx and the, the and Kentucky and places like that is wealth transfer is just not happening yeah. in this country and it needs to happen. Yeah. Yeah. I do think I'm, I've been amazed that the, the concept of the UBI has it has become a national conversation. I was amazed about that. 
And someone like Andrew Yang, I haven't studied his program carefully, but I've heard of him give a number of interviews, and he's a super likable guy, obviously smart. He puts his little math cap on, and you know he makes a pretty good argument, I have to say. And even even some of my libertarian conservative friends have said, yeah, you know, that's not a bad idea. I'm like, whoa, okay. So this could happen. Uh, yeah, as you know, it's uh, Hayek, the original sort of libertarian original idea this was. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, way back in the 50s, I think. So, right. Well, Catherine, great book, How to Be an Epicurean, The Ancient Art of Living Well. It is an ancient art, but I'm a, that was one of the, the joys of reading this book was uh, there's nothing new under the sun. These, you know, 2,500 <laughs> years ago, they were thinking about this stuff and and not and, 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 and in a pretty accurate way. I mean, you have to, you know, change the wording a little bit here and there for modern sensibilities, I guess. But but uh, really, I mean, we, you know, it's like these guys were pretty smart. Yeah. Well, I'm glad we got to cover so many topics. It's been really interesting for me. <laughs> I think we've hit most of the big ones. Yes. So congratulations on the book. And uh, what's next? What are you What are you working on next? <laughs> oh, I have a, uh, a rather scholarly book to write now about okay. Kant and 18th century enlightenment. Uh, did so, you say Kant, yeah. Immanuel Kant? Oh, okay. Yeah. Oh, wow. And, yeah. Well, he's one mm -hmm. of the more interesting people of, of that era, of all time, really. Incredibly uh, yeah. smart guy. Who never yeah. left, who never really left his little hometown, right? Uh, that's right. Yeah. Really smart. Yeah. Even in astronomy, he came up with some ideas that j – just by induction, just thinking about it, that turned out to be, you know, pretty accurate. Yeah. But it, he got a lot of them from uh, Buffon, who's one of my heroes, as mm. I mentioned. Oh, right. Yeah. Right. <laughs> that would have been a good time. If, there, if there's that time machine, when would you like to have been uh, – when would you like to live? No time, but but now because of the dentistry and the food, but <laughs> and the medical. But if I could go back to visit, I think the Enlightenment period. That you know, Hume yeah. and Kant and all those guys, incredible minds. I agree. It wasn't too bad for women either, at least in the uh, era of the uh, salons. Oh right, uh, where if maybe in in France? In, 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 France? in France? Yeah, yeah. yeah. Not so much in you England. Had to get a oh right, yeah. Uh, very small percentage of the population, right, I think. Right. <laughs> well, thank you, Catherine. Great conversation. I really appreciate it. Congratulations on the book. Okay. Thank Thanks you. Thanks again. Bye bye. Right. Bye bye.